You know, Mises, ta Mises is considered a, uh, uh, an individual that uh, follows utilitarianism. I, I have not adapted to the fundamentals of utilitarianism, and yet I have high regard and high respect for it and think it's so important, you know, to look at the policy and see what are, what are the consequences of the policy. If they work, therefore, it is good. I come from it from a slightly different viewpoint. I come from it from a more natural rights viewpoint. I believe I as an individual and you as an individual have a right to your life and a right to your liberty, and governments should be so limited as to protect those rights and to protect your liberties and really not much else. This would involve protecting your personal rights and your property as well as protecting you from foreign invasion. But very, very little else uh, should, should they be, uh, be doing. But uh, I think what happens in Washington is not that they talk about utilitarianism uh, so much, but they are what uh, was referred to by President Klaus, uh, not so much a mixed economy, but uh, Mises called it interventionism. And once you endorse the principle that governments can intervene and do different things, uh, it's so tempting because the principle is the government can intervene. So it's interventionism that is the enemy uh, because uh, they, it will always be abused and the argument will always be whose intervention are we going to endorse? Should we intervene for the benefit of the farmer and the manufacturer or should we intervene for the benefit of another group, the importers or the consumer? Of course, Mises was very clear who the market protected the market made the consumer the king, not the businessman, not the labor worker, but the consumer. The consumer gets to vote with every nickel and dime he spends to decide whether the businessman is successful or not. He gets to decide if, if he's doing a good job and decides whether the labor rates are, are correct. But this interventionism lends itself to those who in politics are pragmatists. We must do what we need to do today. Somebody is hungry, we need to feed them, not considering if we try to help the poor, we destroy the whole system. I mean, strong motivations by so all socialists. I mean, they, unfortunately for us, they have the moral high ground because they're always helping the poor. We're going to build houses and feed the poor and give them medical care, and how can we argue against it? That is the biggest challenge for all of us who believe in liberty, is to know and understand and present the case for liberty. In the sense that it's not, although there may be a selfish element to that, I'm selfish in the sense that I want to be left alone. But in the utilitarian argument that if you believe in liberty, there will be less poor and less who suffer, less who don't have education. So this idea... Uh, of pragmatism uh, unfortunately encourages the politician because they can't see very far. They see the next election and they see a special interest group and they see that if I give them something they are going to vote for us and then the cost will be later on. We abused the monetary system for many, many years from the very start of the Bretton Woods set, set up after World War II. Henry Hazlitt, Henry Hazlitt, the uh, uh, professor and writer in, in, in the United States that befriended Mises. He predicted from the very, uh, the very beginning uh, that, the, uh, that the International Monetary Fund would, would not, uh, uh, would, would not uh, survive and that the Bretton Woods would not survive. And, and he was right about that. So, but the people who wanted it to see the advantages uh, and we were wealthy. The United States was very wealthy. We had essentially all the gold. And at that time, $35 was probably too expensive. So we took license to create money unlimited in order to secure our empire, you know, to spread our troops and take over. And therefore, we abused the system, and soon the markets determined that we had created too many dollars. And of course, that led to the breakdown of the Bretton Woods Agreement. It led, down, it led to a period of time where I can recall uh, clearly that the American people were upset with the French because de Gaulle had the audacity to come 
and hold us to our promise. Turn in the greenbacks. Turn in the, the Federal Reserve notes and take, take the gold from, uh, from the bank. And, uh, of course, the Americans thought that, that was just terrible, but it was we who were break, uh, breaking, uh, breaking the contract. But the, the system was doomed to fail. Mises had predicted it would, just as he predicted about socialism wouldn't work. That long term, we know that fails. So our tremendous job and task as believers in liberty is to fully understand the issue and then to present it in such a way that you can get people to realize that no matter what you see on the short run, uh, on the long run, there are other consequences. As a physician, I would uh, frequently use the analogy that an economy uh, too often gets addicted, addicted to the persistent uh, feeding into it of uh, both deficit spending by government as well as a steady increase in the supply of money and credit, and it tends to hold us over. But to say what we need to do is for me to take the position get rid of the Federal Reserve tomorrow. We know the chaos that it would cause. So I think many of us have devised programs where, as a matter of fact, in the, out of the Gold Commission, one of our proposals there was just to legalize competition. It was only in short years ago, about the time I was elected to Congress in 75. We were not even allowed to, to own gold uh, up, until, up until then from the Depression on. So. The Gold Commission recommended, uh, with uh, my strong emphasis, was to reinstitute gold coinage, and we do, we mint gold and silver coins, but our legal tender laws and our tax laws prevent it from being used for money. But if we as advocates for liberty, if we can't have our way tomorrow, which we can't, I think the goal ought to always be to legalize competition. Let's make sure there are no monopolies in government. Monopoly over money, monopoly over the post office, monopoly over education, monopoly over, uh, over medical care. Don't permit it. Make sure that people can opt out and vote with their feet if they don't like it. And uh, that means that uh, there won't be any radical changes. It doesn't mean that you know, we close down the system. We don't close down Social Security and Medicare and Medicaid. But if we would just encourage those who can and are willing to take care of themselves. In the United States today, there is a tremendous movement away from our public education system. I understand your public education system here it sounds probably a lot better than ours because our people are leaving by the droves. In my district, one of the strongest group of supporters are those who believe in homeschooling, in private schools, in parochial schools, and they're getting out, and many who could afford it would like to, but they can't. But they're essentially taxed twice. They pay to the government, and then they, uh, they'd have to pay for their own home care, home, uh, homeschooling. But a lot of people are doing this. But there's been a movement in the United States against it. They would like to close down all competition with the government schools. So that would be one practical goal for all of us, is to always allow competition with any, any government, uh, government program. And I think that is a very good place uh, to start. You know, in foreign policy, uh, Mises uh, doesn't talk a whole lot about foreign policy, and I mentioned I'm on international relations, but it's become of a much greater interest to me now because just as it did in the 60s, our foreign adventurism and militarism in Vietnam and other places contributed significant to the pressure on the Federal Reserve to create the money and credit that led to the price distortions and the business cycle distortions of the, of the, uh, of the 1970s. But uh, now I believe we're moving in that same direction again in air, uh, mainly because it's a, there's a vacuum out there. Instead of us uh, advocating as our founders of our country advocated minding our own business. And if we want to influence the world, as I do, I want to influence the world through mechanisms like this, through this vehicle. First, we should be setting an example if we care about how the other people think of us. Set a good example about our economy and human rights and whatnot. 
But then the people should learn by persuasion, never, never by force. And yet today, we have not done that. Our founders were very, very clear. They believed strongly in free trade. I believe strongly in free trade. I don't happen to like the international organization who manage trade sometimes for the benefit of one company over another. But free trade and free expression of uh, ideas and free travel to the best of our ability, I think, is the way uh, that we should spread ideas and not through force. But there's one quote here I wanted to use from, quote, uh, from Mises uh, dealing with